Welcome, God. <laughs> Welcome to the first open meeting in what is to be a series of open meetings. We are not yet sure about which venue or which time we will be using on a consistent basis. Lovely. God is in the room. <laughs> I'm happy you're here. My intention coming out here was very much given to me, not conjured up in my own brain. It felt relevant on very many levels. Um, too many to describe. But the more obvious intention is that we have a container that's ongoing, an environment where self-realization and its consequent self-empowerment can flourish, can blossom. I saw that one of the flaws in my teaching was you guys. <laughs> By that I mean the human mind. By that I mean the lack of discipline. So in order to complete the formula, I felt I had to be more direct in my teachings. I desired to be more deliberate, more method methodical. And most importantly, perhaps, I wanted to generate an environment, and a consistent one at that, that would naturally inspire any participant that simply showed up to do the work without having to rely on their own discipline or mood in the morning upon waking up. So, I'm happy you're here. I hope you're still here in a little while. I saw the importance, the crucial missing link being consistency, environment. And so this is the beginning of that, the humble beginnings of such a, the work that, that keeps coming up for now is self-realization school in Sedona that is both physical as well as online through bentinomasaro.tv. So thank you for tuning in, those that are, so that we can reach more people with this experiment, this ongoing experiment of seeing how free people can become when they show up consistently to their own practice with the right guidance, with the right pointers, with the right distillation of teachings so you don't have to confuse yourself unnecessarily. You don't have to read tons of books to find out what to do. And the results are varied. There is parallel realities from this point onwards some of which are amazing. So I hope to meet you there. <laughs> and we're looking in time to create a community, meaning more physical, having land so that people from out of town can visit for extended periods of time, be here for a season of teachings and practice and community. And of course, fun, always. There's always that, mm -hmm. illusion or not. So it'll develop as it will. There's no pressure behind it, but there is a deep calling, calling me to be here at this moment. And I feel really good about that. I feel like I'm in the right place at the right time with the right people. And we'll see what happens or what doesn't happen. Either way. So over the coming weeks, I'll weave more of the topics into the meetings that we've been exploring during the five and two day back to back retreats, May 1st through 7th. But today I'd like to start 
spontaneously, just see whatever arises, whatever the topic may be. But you will be instructed in a certain methodology that is precise, direct, and that leaves room for you to make it your own, but offers you a map so that you understand where you're headed and where are you headed if you follow that methodology would be I could use buzzwords, you know, <laughs> click here, love, peace, bliss, ecstasy, realization, knowing the one infinite creator, both at its manifest level, its creator level, and its absolute level, being free from the tendencies that have run your life for so long, being able to be purely of service, truly of service, mm -hmm. naked, to become a shepherding consciousness, if that is what you so desire. Free. Fearless. Happy. Not based on anything except yourself, your true self. Empowerment, because how could you not be empowered to make the right choices and to make them quickly without hesitating, without fearing, when you are fearless. So your life will naturally accelerate also on the level of illusion, on the level of play. It's not real. It lacks substance. It has no substance. But it has a relevance. Your journey has a relevance. We're going to diminish the significance of that so that you can feel freer and know who you are beyond even your own journey. But simultaneously, that will actually make your journey more significant in the eyes of others. More enjoyable for you, less significant for you. The less significant you are, the better you feel. <laughs> the less significant your life is, the better you feel. It's a polite way of not giving a fuck. <laughs> it's not making your life significant. And then we fear that. Because if my life is not significant, then who am I? That's only because you have become associated with your life. But it's not your life. It's a play. Your true life is something else entirely which requires dedication, commitment, and clear pointing. And that's what I intend to offer. And you will find that your true life is not the life you see before you. Your true life is invisible, but it can become visible to you, it can become experiential to you. And to an extent, I'm sure it already is. But wherever you think you're at, it gets way better. It gets way better. Way truer. Which is better. There's a difference between enlightenment and thinking you're enlightened. Did you know that? <laughs> I will do whatever I can to make this as effortless, as easy, as direct as I possibly can. I mean, to the point of exhaustion, that has been my theme. So I see no reason why I should stop now. But, of course, like I said, 
the weakest link of the equation of what I can offer as a translator of this type of material, as a teacher, if you will. The weakest link in my own capacity to provide that, to provide a new understanding, to upgrade this civilization's sense of spirituality and sense of self, is how willing are you to actually discover what is being pointed to, not just in the mind, but actually be willing to make some sacrifices. Sacrifices along the lines of giving up belief systems that you've held on to for so long, such as I am the body, such as this world is substantially real, it has substance, this world exists independent from my consciousness. The problems in my life are significant, meaningful, I need to talk about them. Who can I talk to about them? I need to share them with you. They're important. They're really valuable. They define who I am. When I die, I die. Those types of beliefs. If we want freedom, we need to make sacrifices. Not necessarily in the old ways. We don't have to become a total renunciate or ascetic. But there is some quality of that that seems to be required. There is some ascetic quality that seems to be required. Which comes naturally when one understands what the goal is, how it is more relevant than whatever other goals one has created from a limited point of view. And by seeing that so clearly, inspiration, especially in the right environment, with the right consistency, with the right pointings, so that it's easy and direct, will naturally make you more ascetic in nature, make you want to make sacrifices and they feel good because they no longer feel like sacrifices. They feel like eliminating redundancies. Things you don't need, things that weigh you down, even things that you thought were really great and you wanted to chase because that seemed to be the most empowering thing to do. When you're willing to let these things go, then total healing can occur. Total healing is to realize the self. The true self, the self beyond space, beyond time, beyond location, beyond body, beyond mind, beyond others, beyond world, beyond your life. Ooh. It's less scary than it sounds. Although, is that true? It might be more scary than it sounds. But you can take it one step at a time. And you have a community here. A lot of these people here, well, quite a few, not a lot, but quite a few, were here during the retreat. And they have a foundation. They have a larger background. Um, since I'm not doing a constant retreat, it's more sporadic. Um, I want to do between one and five meetings a week. We'll see. Um, but at least one. You will naturally find that this becomes easier and easier, more enjoyable, more fun, and it puts things in perspective quite effortlessly for you. All you need to do is show up. Be yourself. Just listen. Just let it in. Let it in. Let, let yourself be brainwashed by this cult. Honestly, one of the most powerful things I have found you know, my seeking and visiting with teachers and being a teacher and seeing many people struggle is to simply listen. You don't have to agree. You don't have to disagree. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to not do anything. You don't have to know the path. You don't have to not know the path. Just sit down. Let it happen. But expose yourself. If you're not exposing yourself to this type of clear pointing that comes from a place of truth and transcendence, if you're not exposing yourself to that, it will not sink in. If all you're exposing yourself to is the matrix of thought and the matrix of control and the matrix of collective delusion, then it doesn't matter what you do. It's very, 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 very rare. And I'm sorry to say this. I wish it was different. I wish I could say... No, I have full faith in you guys. 
Absolutely. Everyone can do this. Go do it. Never come to a meeting. Never listen to any of my talks or similar talk. But I cannot say that. I've seen it to be opposite. Even when people have profound realizations after a week of intense practice, environment creeps back in inevitably. The collective consciousness takes a hold of the body. That's how it works. You are incarnate here. You need to fight this energy by deliberately disciplined in a disciplined way, choosing who you wish to become, how you wish to think, and what you wish to practice, what you wish to realize and focus upon. If that discipline wanes for too long, you'll start to gather, accumulate sediment again. Okay, so you need a consistent environment. Trust me, that's the only reason I'm doing this. I have no reason to have an environment like this for personal gain or reason. So what you need is an environment that is consistent in its ability to drop you into the right space. Do this frequently enough, frequently enough, frequently enough, frequently enough, and it will leave perforations in your consciousness that always allow you to seep through to deeper levels of truth, even while you're living your everyday life. So, just trust me when I say that if you just expose yourself to this, that is enough. The work will come, the discipline will come, the choices, the definitive choices, the sacrifices that at first seem sacrificial, later on seem like the greatest gift to yourself. They will come naturally from your very own heart when we remove these layers over and over and over again. And again, the most effortless way for a seeker, for a mind, to achieve great, great leaps in this is to not try too hard at first, at least, until the path is super clear and it is intrinsically motivated, and it's intrinsically clear, intrinsically guided. Until that point, expose yourself, expose yourself, expose yourself, marinate, inundate yourself with this material. This is the easiest way I've found to make great, great leaps, great transformations without really having to do anything. All you have to do is commit to the fact that you will expose yourself, whether you feel good or bad, whether you believe you can or not, whether you like the teaching or not, listen to it. Listen to it. Just listen. Just let it happen. Something will happen. Sooner or later, the magic will drop in. And that's what we want. Right? So see how you feel after a few meetings. Don't give up after two meetings. Come to more of these meetings. After three or four weeks, see how you feel about it. If there's no effect whatsoever, or it doesn't resonate, you just don't enjoy it, great. Leave. At least you gave it a true shot. This is an opportunity. That's what I'm saying. And so, you will know after about three or four weeks whether this is, actually the first one that came to mind was five weeks, but you'll get a glimpse before then. But if you stay with this for three to five weeks, by the end of those five weeks, you will have a transformed consciousness. Your everyday life seems different. There will be a different light that shines upon the things in your experience. Effortlessly, you don't even know what you did for it. Sure, you did some meditations. Sure, you did maybe some homework or some meditations that I, I asked you to do or instructed or suggested. But really, when you think about it, you did a minimal amount of work. You just showed up. You were just receptive. You showed up. And something has changed. Something that's irreversible. You can't go back to your previous version. You just feel different. You feel fundamentally altered. If you're scared for this, it is better to leave now. <laughs> because all your scattered addictions, including those who do not consider themselves addicted because they're addicted to a normal life, so they don't stand out as addicts, all these addictions, all these addictions will be rechanneled into an addiction for God, divine, bliss, love, eternity, infinity. If that scares you, it's better not to start. Because once you start, there is no way back. 
So after this meeting, decide whether you even want to give the five weeks a go. If you don't, obviously, no hard feelings. Who cares? It's your life. Perfect, beautiful, free will. God is with you regardless. <laughs> Truly. Truly. That is your freedom. Absolutely, of course. If you're still interested, give it a shot for three to five weeks. See if you're altered. If you're not altered, then you might as well go. I would even suggest you go. If after five weeks there is no alteration of your everyday consciousness, it just doesn't work for you. Either my teachings don't work or you don't work. <laughs> <laughs> With my teachings. <laughs> Which is perfect. You can still come to the parties, don't worry. Okay, let's talk about this. Perhaps one of the first things to shed light on as we are about to embark upon this journey, and it is a journey, it's the journey of involution. is to have a good look at our own sense of well, self. What's your current sense of self? Particularly whatever paradigm you have. Okay, this is going to seem like the perfect theme meeting to have to start a cult. So please understand that's not my intention. <laughs> <laughs> the reason it so happens that I start with this is A, because of inspiration that I had today along these lines, and B, because it actually is kind of crucial to engage in anything to be able to absorb it and get the most out of it. It is to break apart the pattern that exists. It's to break apart the rigidity that exists, the filters that exist. So again, if you don't feel comfortable with this at any given moment, please feel free to leave the room. No hard feelings. Don't worry, I'm not going to make you do weird shit. Or anything. <laughs> so get a sense of your sense of self as it is constructed by the sense of the controller. The one who knows what's best for itself, the one who thinks it knows all kinds of things, really. That sense of the controller who really comes from that fundamental root chakra idea of survival, then filtered into the second and the third into personal worth and who am I in relationship to others and how am I safe in relationship to others is a fundamental one when it connects to the root. So this program has been running us for centuries, okay? This is the problem. This is the difficulty, the challenge. It's the imposter self. You all, as I'm speaking, have an imposter self. What is the imposter self? It's the thinker, the controller. It's the substitute servant that came into being when you did not yet know how to take care of yourself as a small child. And probably the more traumatic your experiences have been, the more dense you might have this controller aspect within you. God bless your heart. But that doesn't prevent you from coming to total healing. Total healing. Just imagine that for a second before we continue. 
between you and God, between you and the all that is, what would it be like for all your needs for control to be absolutely absolved, relinquished, resolved, disappeared into the only thing that ever was, which is the only thing that then remains, which shines as infinite awareness, bliss, true love, not the human version, true love, divine love, wisdom, the ability to be unwavering without any insistence whatsoever, yet unwavering on what is true, without the need for thinking that you're right, but absolutely unwavering in your relationship to anything that is offered to you, whether it comes from another person or your own imposter self-remnant mind. When you did not yet have the means to consciously take care of yourself, you started, like an animal, you started responding to pleasure and pain, pleasure and pain, pleasure and pain. Later on, this became a little more sophisticated, and it became mental emotional pain and pleasure, mental emotional pain and pleasure. Hence, your addiction, which is actually your calling home, got channeled into the externalized world of form, shape, size, people, others, sensations, feelings, thoughts, emotions, pleasure, pain, etc. So you became addicted to God in a form where it is not seen in its original nature. But we're all addicted to God, which is what we are. We're all addicted to life itself. We're all addicted to the source. The one infinite creator is what we are addicted to. We just channel it in different ways depending on how the imposter mind offers to us at any given second that this is the safest way to go. Or this is the best way to go. Or this is the greediest way to go. You can get the most out of this. Or even without greed, just you can get the most out of this. Therefore, it makes sense to go here. You don't have to kill anyone for it. You don't have to kill anyone for not doing it. Doing it seems to give more benefits, so why not? So along those lines, the imposter mind will always try to get you to either safety, depending on your history, or accumulation, which is another way of being safe as well, to accumulate so you're safe. So let's look at that for a second, or a few seconds. So the controller replaces God, but when God is seen, it replaces the controller. This is the journey to self-realization. We want the controller to be absolutely annihilated. <laughs> Ultimately, don't do this just yet, <laughs> unless you want to. But the imposter needs to be negotiated out of its own contract with you. Does that make sense? Yes. In most cases. Now, there are some cases where that's not necessary. But in most cases, because we have become what we are, which is consciousness, pure, infinite consciousness, free of location, free of a body, free of a world, free of anything, pure, infinite bliss, love, consciousness, okay? That is God. That's what you are, and you will find this out if you stick around for five weeks. I promise, if not, you should go. <laughs> That's what you are, but that, because it's so formless, it's so invisible, it doesn't have a form of its own, it'll become identified with whatever form is placed in front of it. Okay, so the imaginative mind places in front of itself a body consistently and a world and things and important topics and significance and meaning and safety and others and all that. So since pure awareness, which is formless, infinite, lovely, just lovely, ease, <laughs> bliss, <laughs> when that becomes identified with the human form, it creates the controller mind. It creates the substitute servant. God is now replaced with the controller. Some call it the ego. It's an imposter. Okay, it's not who you are. But since you have become identified as and with the imposter, it's very difficult for you to see without thinking. And any thought you have is the imposter. 
including the thoughts you think are best for you. You don't know what's best for you. I'm sorry. To the degree that you can be without thoughts and know the true resonance of spirit within your heart, undiluted, unfiltered, without any conceptions, without any concepts whatsoever, to that degree, which is rare, will you know what's best for you. Until that time, you will think, and you will think, and you will think, and you will think that it's you who's thinking. You'll think that it's you who has had all this past experience to rely on. God does not rely on memory. I can tell you that. Because its motivation is not safety. So it needs not memory to predict outcome. You don't need your history. It's never been your life. It's in front of you. It's a show. It's a shit show. <laughs> For some people, it's a fun game. It's a play. Whatever it be, it's not you. You are God. Your infinite freedom. Those are nothing but fancy words to the imposter filter. Maybe you get a glimpse of it. Again, depending on your level of openness and experience with giving away the mind altogether, you can hear what I'm saying to the degree that you're not thinking about what I'm saying. You're not filtering. You're not protecting. But notice whatever protection you have in you now, subtly, think she wouldn't even label protection, but something in you is a little on edge right now. Something. Every single one of you, there's something there. Some very subtly, some locked up in fear, what's happening. Any degree between that, what is it in you that is not completely at ease right now? Look for the remnants of the imposter self, pretending to be you, pretending to keep you safe. From what? Safe from what? More of God? You don't want to let more of God in? Are you sure? Just want to have this tiny little patch of God and call it human? When you can have all of God in infinite abundance, overwhelming grace, indescribable joy union with the one infinite creator for Christ's sake <laughs> also those new to me I'm a little irreverent from time to time I hope you don't mind and can see past that I wouldn't want that to distort the way that my teachings or the teachings can land for you but I will continue to be irreverent <laughs> Whatever is uncomfortable about that tends to come from the imposter mind anyway. So the imposter has fooled you. Joke's on you. Joke's on all of us. We're all in this together after all. The imposter has fooled us all. It's very clever. So in order to unwind and undo, uh, undo yourself in the one infinite creator, to see God, to be God, to live God, to breathe God, to know God only, more and more, as much as you want to. Many of us will have to go through a process of renegotiating the contract that we originally signed with the imposter mind. The first one to go on that list is, I am absolutely 100% you. 
If there's a 100% attachment and identification with the imposter mind, there's nothing I can say, or anyone can say, or anything you can study that can get absorbed and reach a true level of marination, where it can grow and blossom. So in order for this realization to flower in you, which is the only thing you're here for, I'm assuming, along the way, yes, there will be meditations, yes, there will be bliss, yes, there will be direct pointings that make you feel instantly liberated and free, and laughter ensues, and it changes you forever, for sure. But along the way, there will also be moments where we will have to renegotiate that contract. We have to sit down, look at where we're substantially holding ourselves back from letting more of God into our lives. And we have to be willing to renegotiate those addictions. That's what I meant with certain sacrifices need to be made. But when you get to the level where that becomes relevant for you in order to move on, that you need to renegotiate that contract, or give it up altogether, depending on how ready you are, how tired you are of that contract. We'll have to go through that process from time to time. But like I was saying, when you are ready for that, when it is relevant for that to happen, it will no longer feel like a sacrifice. It will feel like the first thing you want to do. Because you can now feel how heavy it has always weighed on you. You haven't realized that you're wearing this backpack this whole time. Even when you're sitting down, you don't have to wear it. And when you take a train somewhere, you're still wearing the suitcase. Why? Just put it down. The train is carrying the load. You don't have to. Trust in God and your life will be just fine. Trust in life. Whatever word you want to use. Infinite awareness. The one infinite creator. Love. They're not completely synonymous, all of these, but they will do. Whatever word resonates for you. Christ. Why do you feel unsafe, O oh, imposter mind? What could possibly happen to you other than more of the mystery of the one infinite creator revealing itself. And why is that scary, O oh, imposter mind? Why are you afraid? What has God done to you? How have you been harmed and hurt? Betrayed, abandoned, misunderstood, failed, discarded. Where does that fear come from? Why be afraid in circumstances when there is no need for it? Why carry it around with you all this time? You needed it back then. But who needs it right now? Why not let in the divine infinite love and bliss of the one infinite creator and wash away your tears, your fears, your struggles, your attachment to your past, Wash away your identification with your past. I know you worked hard to achieve it, but it doesn't exist anymore. And it has never existed to begin with. There is only God. What else would it be made out of? There's only one creator, and it's infinite. So it can appear as everything. Every portion of your life has always been the light of God. In form, your labels have made it nasty. My finger doesn't call itself a finger. My pain doesn't say it's hurting. It's easy with the finger. 
more difficult with the pain, huh? My pain doesn't say it's hurting. I say it's hurting. I create the pain. The abuse doesn't say it's abusing me. I learned that when I grow up. Oh, you were abused? Oh, great. Hold on to that. You've been abused. You've been victimized. The abuse doesn't say you're being abused. You say that you're being abused. You can unsay that if you're willing, if there's no pride around your pain, or if the desire for liberation is greater than the pride around your pain. And yes, in an ideal world, you would get acknowledged for your suffering. You would get validated. You would get validated, loved, appreciated. The whole world would look at your life, investigate, and feel sorry for your ass. In an ideal world, this form of healing would happen in that way. And you would be able to then release with it, being acknowledged and recognized. But why wait for that acknowledgement to earn the freedom that is yours from before your life ever began or was even a thought in the Creator's mind? Why hold yourself back wanting relative healing before absolute healing can be let in. And another thing about me, for those who are new, I will always try to push you to your edges, okay? I do this out of love, believe it or not. And so you may not always feel comfortable in my presence. That's okay, that's still love. I still love you. More than you know. Fact, it's my reason for being. So take that as far as you can. And if you had enough, fine. <laughs> I won't be upset. But since there's not that many people, I'm assuming in your life, that can push you in a clear way the right edge that you need to see, witness, acknowledge, and transform, and be able to let go of, I will do that, okay? Sometimes it'll be greatly comfortable, it'll be greatly liberating, and joyful, and fun, and sometimes it'll be a little difficult. Sometimes you'll have to swallow a few times and think I'm an asshole. <laughs> That's okay. I'll still do it. especially if you continue to want this freedom. There's nothing I wouldn't do for someone that wants this freedom more than they want their imposter self to preserve itself. One who does not want that and is bullshitting themselves and after multiple opportunities shows that they're not really ready to make that sacrifice, to depart, to disassociate, to disidentify from the false self I have no patience for. One who shows that willingness within themselves, that true desire. Patience is not even a concept. There is no end to it. I'm just there. I'm you. There's no patience. So we are in this together, and in a way, this is a relationship, and I'm okay treating it as such, and seeing it as such. My relationships are intense. Mm -hmm. Passionate. Mm -hmm. Truthful, no matter what. Non-supportive of your ego. because that is what robs you of your healing. And I do not wish to participate in that, even if it makes you feel better. I will not compliment you on things you think you did great when you think you did great from an ego point of view. I will not be nice 
sweet or courteous or gentlemanly or do the thing I'm supposed to do. When you come to me with something false and think it's true. If you come to me with something false and you're aware that it might not be true and you're willing, very willing to see that it's not true. I'll be a gentleman. <laughs> and this is not a war between who's right and who is wrong. If that ever starts, I'll leave that room or wherever we are. I'm not interested in that. I've come too far for that nonsense. I'm not here to argue with your mind. I might listen for a minute. I might offer a couple suggestions. If those suggestions are not taken, I'm not interested in our relationship. You can still come, most likely, depending on the gravity of your <laughs> non-willingness. But I will not be interested to listen to you. I will not be there for that. Because if it's clear that there's no way that you're going to transcend that, then it is a waste of my time and there's plenty of others who are at a level where they can embrace that. Outside of teaching environments, I'm much more generous with being flexible and you'll feel much more comfortable with me most likely um, if that ever happens in this Sedona community. Because there is no expectation, there is no agreement. But here, there is an agreement. And I'll show up as the truest, brightest, clearest, no-nonsense version of myself that I can for your sake. And you promise to show up here within the teaching context as the most truthful, honest, willing, deliberate, humble practitioner, practitioner, participant. You can be. If that is the case, then alchemy will be very, very swift. And this group will become one in more ways than your mind can presently perceive of or imagine. And you will grow as a whole, not just as a part. And I will grow as my mission here will fulfill itself that much more. The brightness will increase. And given the fact that we are in Sedona, which is like a big drain, vortex, every energy that is generated here will affect the planetary sphere that much more than most other locations on Earth. So not only are you doing this for you, you're doing this for the world. So yeah, safety. You guys feel safe yet? <laughs> Very effortless environment. No pressure. No need to look at yourself. You can just be here and tell your stories like every other spiritual community out there. So this is not that type of community. Maybe outside of the teaching corridors. It can be, depending on which people you meet and what agreements you have. But in this space, there is no nonsense because I want you to grow as fast as you can. I want you to experience so many growing pains you don't know where to look. I want you to be exhausted with your growth so that when you do give yourself finally a break after pushing and pushing and pushing, all the fruits of your work will come flooding in at once and you'll never be the same again. And I have always valued my time, well, at least in recent years. And so I will not waste any of mine, <laughs> not even on you. And so the intention is always to be as quick about it, as direct about it as we can be. Again, if that brings up discomfort, that's fine. Just let it be there. Let it be part of the equation. There's a reason why it's coming up for you. It's pointing to a core fear that you captured somewhere along the way and thought was you. Imposter mind, 
reinvigorated in posture, mind, enhanced. We have an enhanced imposter mind through all of our experiences. My intention is to bring those barriers down. To drop most common sense, what we believe is common sense, so that the intuitive intelligence of God can operate through us freely without any ego, insistence, or arrogance in the way. Now mind yourselves, because arrogance often comes in the package of I'm taking care of myself, or this is just what resonates, or I'm feeling bad about this, I'm feeling good about this, I'm going for this. You have to understand that where your feelings come from, if not from pure divine intuition, it is always from the imposter mind. So be as honest with yourself as you can be. If something is scary to you, it's usually a good sign. If something is a little scary and you feel on edge, there is something there for you. To say it doesn't resonate because it feels scary is to believe the imposter mind over the intuition and the synchronicity of the universe, which obviously brought this to your attention. Faith versus skepticism. Trust versus fear. Love versus doubt. It's always the same choice, my friends. Every single second, every single split in our path, it's the same freaking choice. And we're going to ensure that you get so good at making that choice, so good at making that choice, that you'll always choose the right thing regardless of your feelings. And this will transform your feelings. This will turn feelings into bliss. Instead of having an emotional body, you'll have a bliss body. <laughs> Doesn't sound very good to the imposter mind, but it sounds good to something in you, truth, within, no matter how filtered, always recognizes truth when spoken or pointed to. That's why I trust that you will know or recognize what is true for you. Even if you're afraid and you need to take a little break or whatever it is during this process. But as long as you keep the exposure alive and keep the practice alive, you will find you will find what you find, but it's amazing. It's incredible, you deserve it. It is total, 100% healing. And past that point, it's, it's just bliss. It's just love, it's service. It's the deepest form of satisfaction you can have as a human expression of God, which is a show, it's not real but it's happening in front of you, so you will register some changes in your life, even though it's not you. It's an expression of you. So there's two processes in a way. There's the process of getting out of this world, which is where the bliss starts to happen. Because the further we go out of this world, which is an illusion, you can't really go out of it because it's not really here, but for sake of language. The farther we know ourselves free of this world, the more bliss, the more divinity, the more clarity, the more wisdom will flow through us, the more we will become transhuman. Which is a good thing, by the way. It's not a bad thing. I mean, look at humanity. The other process is the process that is relative, more relative, meaning the negotiating of the contract and the processes that happen and the fear responses that happen and the emotional responses that happen and the trying to get clear on what is what in your mind that happens. 
So the absolute process is simply dissolving deeper and deeper into the light of God, which is not of this world, of which this world is but a speck of dust expression. It pales in comparison to the light that you are, which is what we want to discover. That is going to make the journey easier. Because when you know, when you have direct experiences more and more, that you are the eternal, immortalizable, infinite awareness, God, light, bliss, the I, I, the universal I. The more you get to know yourself as that, the freer and freer and freer you feel from your life. And if not for your life, what is holding you back? All your obstacles, all your weights happen inside of your life. What if you could experience yourself outside of this life, while this body is having its life. It will obviously make easier the processes that happen to the mind, because there will be much less fear. There will be much more bliss to compensate for it. In fact, most of your troubles will simply fade away. So ideally, that's the approach we want to take. We don't want it to be hard work necessarily. We only want it to be hard work where it's absolutely necessary. So if we get to dissolve ourselves in infinite light and become that which is in everything, great, by all means. But sometimes you will find the imposter self will hold on and will prevent you from going deeper. Then you'll need to lovingly but decisively look at that tension, look at that contraction. What belief did you pick up along the way that's not true in God, it's only true in mind? Can you unfurl that? Can you take the tension out of it? Can you compare it to the light of God and see that it's no big deal? Again, an insignificant life is the best feeling life. The more significant you make your problems, your history, what you've achieved, how far you've come, how wise you are, how well you're able to balance all your emotions and your traumas. That's the worst of all, when the imposter feels really proud about maintaining all of its, feels really good about itself and it's pretending to be you and you're believing that that's your level of bliss, that that's all you can handle. That's not bliss, that's suffering. <laughs> Ultimately, any lie is suffering. And any lie is you thinking you're the mind. So ultimately, you will see you're not the mind. You're not any of the mind. Any of it. The result, again, is happiness. Okay? The less burdened you are, the happier you are. It's not a difficult phenomenon. It's very natural. The less you give significance to the things in your life, Obviously, the more space is left over for simply being and getting to know yourself inwardly instead of being so outward focused. And even thoughts and emotions are outward from God's point of view. They're not inward. Inward alone is awareness, existence, beingness, bliss, God. That is inwardness of mind. Inwardness of mind is not, mm, yes, I'm feeling this emotion, mm, but I'm okay with it. That's not inwardness. That's externalization. Inwardness would be, but wait a second, where am I looking from? What is it that's aware of this? Whoop. This goes to the background. You don't even notice exists. And the light of God shines forth. That is inwardness. So, the imposter self has tricked you in believing you are a spiritual person. Especially if you are local. <laughs> there is a collective epidemic in Sedona <laughs> where everyone thinks they're highly spiritual and evolved and advanced and they use that. I'm not saying you're not. I'm just saying it's get, it gets used as believing that that's who you are. Right? That's the imposter. But the imposter can only be the imposter if it senses you have susceptibilities within you to believe its lies. 
Once you relinquish these, and those are the sacrifices you need to be willing to make along the way, once the time, but gather that willingness, prepare. This is a school, after all. Imagine Sidonian culture without identifying with anything they've achieved or seen or heard, whether through physical or non-physical means. Imagine a pristinely, profoundly awake Sedona community. Awfully truthful and authentic and beautifully loving, infinitely patient those who are sincere and humble in their efforts of life, whether spiritually oriented or just trying to fix their tire along the side of the road. But innocent, true, genuine, infinite patience. Imagine this community not needing to tell its stories all the time, not needing to explain everything it has experienced on the inner planes or wherever else. Imagine a community where a pristine, transparent awareness of God as all reigns supreme. And there's nothing but this love light flowing through this being with no ego whatsoever. <coughs> the ground is here for that. The fruits aren't there yet, but the ground is here, the soil is here. I'm starting to plant seeds right now, and you guys can all plant seeds <coughs> of your own. This could be a place on earth the world has never seen or anticipated, where mundane concepts aren't just replaced by spiritual ones, but spirituality is taken to its heart, which is God knowing itself the one infinite creator in full awareness of itself. Whether you're wearing a red t-shirt with a rainbow on it or a black one with a skull, who gives a damn? It doesn't make you any different. Same lines, different colors. What if that could change? What if we could become a profoundly attuned, beautifully quiet, yet having fun at the right times or all the time, whatever, but there is this attunement, this beautiful, pristine, precise, silent attunement to one another as God. And there is the first science of a true telepathic society starting to form, a true fourth density living, breathing world, even though we are talking about realizations that far exceed that of fourth density. But it'll help us integrate quicker and be shepherds of that vibration of fourth density for those who are going from third to fourth. Shepherds need to hold a higher clarity, a higher transparency to God, a higher frequency thus, in order to serve those that are making that spiritual transition. You can't shepherd a group that's at your own level. And I am interested in creating a community of shepherds where concepts are replaced with bliss with love, with truth. A concept that's true is still false. <laughs> Only God is. Nothing needs to be said. 
thought, concluded. All you need to conclude is that only God is. Don't worry, we'll do more exercises and methods and all that. But that's the essence of it. If you can stay with that realization and know what it means, that would suffice. There is only God. Only God is. There's nothing else. All your thinking is simply untrue. Only God is, and that shines forth as the infinite light. I'm excited to be sharing in this light with you all for the purpose of upgrading the civilization. Your participation is and would be highly appreciated. I'll be the best I can be at what is natural to me. You all be the best at what you do and what you are and what's natural to you. Then there will be a symbiotic relationship that will upgrade this town without them even knowing it. You'll notice you'll have less conversations in the crystal shops. <laughs> That'll be a sign of our progress. <laughs> You'll still go there. You'll still meet the same people. But there's no need. There's no need to explain yourself. There's no need to talk about the latest concept. There's a profound, pristine, silencing presence around you that demands alignment. I'm looking forward to growing more familiar with these faces in front of me. Seeing where I can be of assistance. If the willingness is there. In the past I've tried to carry too much of other people's load in creating something new and the responses have usually been lacking. So it is also my resolve to no longer do that, meaning that I will stay put right here, not move a single muscle for you guys, do exactly what I came here to do, nothing more, nothing less. And whatever it is that you want to co-create, will happen through your agreed upon desire and willingness as a community. Sweet. Well, that's everything that was heavy and intense that I want to share right now. <laughs> Any questions? Sorry, one second. Thank you. I was so loud last time. Thanks. I just wanted to say after the weekend, I went back after, well, first I listened to the weekend again. And then I was like, well, what else can I listen to? So I went back to the academy, which I've gone over several times and thought, maybe the infinity lessons. I kind of wanted to see how they were 
um, similar. And I thought, listening to them again, that there were a lot of similarities to what you shared this weekend. Is that like a good place to go to fill in? To keep For sure, yeah. Involved? A lot of people, it'd be nice to go, and it's free anyway, so it's easy to access. If you go to trinfinityacademy.com and explore the infinity course, um, this particularly pertains to going beyond even consciousness and realizing the infinite one creator at its absolute level before anything came into being. Thanks. Cool. Cool. Yes. Um, and so the last week is a more practical, drawn out approach, a newer approach to that, uh, more focused on that in a way. Um, yeah, and so you can get these recordings as well. And um, again, these meetings will continue to elaborate on that as well. Yes, let me get you the microphone over here. Where? Where? I was with you this weekend, and thank you for that. And um, you were speaking about meditation and somebody had asked you a question about their meditation practice which kind of got me um, wanting to ask you something about where I was at with my meditations because uh, for a long time it's been uh, very similar in a way but um, and that is my mind can get quiet very quickly and then there's sometimes there's an awareness through the meditation and sometimes it just kind of fade away and then I can feel myself coming back. And um, it's, my whole life is transformed, of course, in my meditations and my practices and all. And there's so much more to awareness than just fading away and coming back. And I'm just wondering, because you were, you were mentioning before something about he was, I think, stuck in a place of the mind still, possibly, and not breaking through. So I'm just wondering if you have any ideas from my description, what might be going on and how to break through to a deeper place or maybe a, just a different place. What's the plateau that you experience? Pardon? What is the plateau that you experience? Um, the plateau? How would you describe the container that you're in that you don't seem to go past? What does it feel like? What do the walls feel like that you can't go past? within which you can roam free, but when you try to get out of the house, it's locked. Like, what does that feel like? Well, that's just, that's just it. There's a, there's a, there's a part, there's a, um, when I, when I kind of fade in, like fade in or fade out or whatever, it, there's not, there's actually not an awareness anymore. I, I'm just, I'm, there's not an awareness, so I can't even describe that to you, like where the walls of that plateau might be. As in unconsciousness? Um, no, I mean, that's, yeah. It's Are you aware that you're not aware? If you're aware that you're not aware, it's great. Yeah, I, I am aware that I'm not aware. Okay. And what does it feel like, so to speak? Um, it feels just very quiet. Mm-hmm. I've been very quiet for decades, and it's like, well, that's nice, you know. And you know, it's really, it's, it's kind of funny to complain about a quiet mind, but it just seems to be, like, I'm like, okay, and then what? Mm. You know, you know, because there's like you were speaking about that place of bliss, of, of having bliss as an experience yeah. in your life, you know, and that doesn't come up in the meditations. It's just what okay. I'm describing. So this is what I. This is what I call a mental container. Yeah. Right? So just for everyone's sake, that wasn't at the week. Um, awareness is formless, but it will become confined. It will feel like whatever you confine it to. That's a mental container. Now, a gross example of a mental container might be that you have an emotional trigger, and you feel like you're the body, someone slapped you in the face, uh, you were just trying to be loving, and so now you're triggered. Right? That now awareness feels like being triggered and being emotional and having a physical body and feeling shame and feeling whatever it is. So that's your experience of awareness. Truth is you only ever experience awareness. But it's colored with so many different containers that we call it the world. But really it's awareness. The world is awareness. Therefore, I can say there is no world. Only God is. God has become the world in your mind's eye, but it's not. 
The world doesn't really exist. It's only God. So these mental containers become subtler as we start our meditation practice, as we start to transcend these levels of consciousness. What happens is that we start to turn these subtler states into a mental container as well. So now it doesn't feel like you're a, the body and you're like fighting and struggling. Now it feels like you're perhaps infinite space. Very tricky. Because it's great and it's quiet for days. But as long as you have the sense, now what? It's not the true realization. You want to continue the practice from that state. It's a perfectly valid place to practice from. You don't have to avoid that container. You just have to go through it. You just have to transcend it. You have to realize that you're in it. Um, silence can be another mental container. It's always tricky to figure out exactly where someone is at because there's so many different states and shapes and sizes that the mind can create, um, which will sound a lot like the enlightened states, but they're not always the same thing. We can create versions of them that mimic the qualities of an enlightened state and they feel much better than being identified with the human, but it's still you being identified with a mental container. It just changed the way it looked. Okay. The way that you'll feel that this is the case is if you can still wonder if this is the truth or not. If you can still wonder, it's not the truth. <laughs> So since there, is, since there is a desire in you to go deeper, that shows you that this is not as deep as you can go, that this is not the truest you can realize. So my question to you would be, what knows that? And can you place your attention on the knower of the silence, rather than be, oh, nice, silence. Rather than being focused on the silence or even becoming the silence, can you ask yourself, what is it? Who or what is it or must it be that somehow knows of this silence? And when you start to intuitively get a sense of that, turn your attention away from the silence and onto the knower of the silence. This is a sure way to get you out of whatever department you're in. Know the knower, not the known. Who knows this? What knows this? Because when you ask what knows about this, you're asking what is beyond this, what is not confined to this. Does it make sense? Oh, no, it makes sense. It's, and, that's a very sure way for most people to get out of some of those mental plateaus that are mimicking qualities of enlightenment, but it's not the true satisfaction of bliss. Right, or knowing the God, really. And, the, and of course, there, is a question, there was a question, which you're right, you know, if I'm questioning it, then you have to, you know, then it's... And, and part of that... Was Wait, brought, sorry, what are you saying? Uh, well, there, so, the but, fact that I'm questioning it, there is yes. more like that that there might be something deeper or more yes what you're saying is wonderful pointing and i will use that and i think part of why i started to question it is realizing that <laughs> where's the bliss you know like just what you've been talking about over the weekend like mm -hmm. the bliss factor like that that being mm -hmm. part of our experience the bliss begins where location ends hmm Bliss begins where location ends. A lot of these mental containers still have a sense of location to them. Bliss, God, knows no location. So if you notice, even in silence, that there's still a sense of space, or like being over here, and, or seeing an environment of some kind in your mental eye, is there any of that in the silence? Is there any sense of location whatsoever? Sometimes not. I mean, a lot of times not, actually. That's but do you maintain awareness while it's not? Do you maintain awareness of awareness while you're not aware of location? Or are you not aware of location because you haven't maintained awareness? Right. Possibly so then that. you're basically going, you're, you're waking up into a mental container of whatever that state is that you describe that's not completely satisfactory, but it feels better than suffering. So you, that's what you wake up into in a sense, during that one meditation. You wake up into that and then you fall asleep. And then you wake up into it and then you fall asleep. In, when you fall asleep, you have no sense of location, but you're not awake while you're falling asleep, so to speak, while you're becoming unconscious. If you can maintain awareness while you go unconscious, then there will be true clarity. So similarly, maintain the, maintain the alertness. A lot of times when people get stuck in a plateau for too long, it's because they are not, they're not continuing the practice. 
They're not increasing the brightness, the vividness of their own awakeness right there, their awareness, their investigative power, their power to be, to see clearly, to know oneself in that state. If you go to sleep to the state you've realized, then it'll just become kind of polluted and not really pleasant at, after a certain point, which is fine because then you'll be inspired to cut through that. So just ask yourself, what knows this? And you can't help but be clearer. What knows this? What knows this? Increase the brightness. Turn the brightness up on pure awareness. And start to drop even containers like silence and space and nothingness. And just be in the bliss of awareness aware of itself. Or God knowing God. It knows no location. If you are focused on location, if you have a sense of location right now, to that degree, you will not be able to experience the bliss of God. So close your eyes. Give away all sense that you notice in your experience of having a location, having a body, having a space, and realize that that which sees the space itself knows no space in its own state. Awareness aware of space is awareness aware of space or location. But awareness inquiring what's aware of this location, when it forgets about the location and it turns onto itself, there is a disappearance of a world of location. And there the bliss starts to arise the light, the clarity starts to come. The divinity, the transcendence starts to walk into the back door because you're for once focused on the back door, not on everything in front of you. What's behind you? Where do you come from? Not what do you see? How do you see? Who sees? Who sees? The infinite seer sees. See that. See that. See that until it takes away your sense of a world in your meditations at least. And you can start marinating in the light of God directly with no need, no concepts, no crystals needed. They're great, but not needed. You're now self-sufficient in your recognition of God. Just turn back onto yourself your true self, the self that is, that which alone has isness, pure isness, deep within, the intuitive, universal I which is, the I that is. Every time a sense of location is known again, just discard it, just ignore it for a moment and go back to what knows about the location. And does that awareness know location in its own state of knowing itself? And you'll find that it doesn't unless you conjure it back up. Location, you see, binds you to a separate self. Free of location, who is there to be identified with? You're no longer part compartmentalizing God. You are God. The one mysterious I is that shines as all things, pervasive equally throughout. That is the I we wish to identify with more at the expense of the lesser I, the smaller I, which is based in location, body, form, versus a world. Because if I'm over here, then all of you are over there. How can I love you? You could hurt me. If I'm over here, you could harm me. If I see location, my root chakra gets activated too. If I don't see location, I have no fear. Naturally, just instantly. You see, a moment of true clarity is a moment of true, complete enlightenment. You might not notice it. It might not, quote unquote, integrate and dispel your whole illusion. It might come right back again. But that moment, that brief moment where awareness knows itself and nothing else, bliss is there. There is an absence of a world. There is an absence of separation. There is union. 
You just don't have enough quote unquote time to process all that and let it dismantle all your other beliefs, which kick right back in. Oh, you're right back into the body. Now you start t talking about that experience as if it's not you. Because you've re-identified, re-associated with location. Without location, who the hell are you? That's who you are. Whatever remains when all sense of location and dimensionality is gone, that is you. On one level. There's another level beyond that. The absolute level, which isn't even that. But it expresses itself primarily as the great universal I am, which shines equally as all things appearing equally as the great illusion of evolution and involution. You are fulfilling the job of this illusion by realizing the self, which is the substratum of that illusion, and finally using that as a trampoline to realize the one infinite creator at its absolute level before creation or God ever came into being. There is the one infinite creator as God, and there's the one infinite creator as beyond God or before God, older than God. God is, the absolute, does not have that same limitation. It does not have to be. It's the source from which beingness arose. You are older than God. Before God was there, you were there. What was that like? Before pure awareness, beingness, bliss, light, love, the substratum of all that is, appeared on you, what were you then? Because you were there as you are there now. Because not a moment has passed between before creation, during creation, and after creation. To the absolute, not a single moment has passed. So when I ask you, who were you before God? That's the you that's aware of the aware of my voice right now. It can never appear. It's too absolute to appear. It would limit itself if it could appear. That's why it's so difficult to find. <laughs> How do you find something that doesn't even show up in any of God's realities? In fact, it doesn't even show up in pure God. How do you find that? By the art of deducing, the art of contrast, the art of trampolining. If not this, then what? At a very deep, profound, intuitive I am level, you can apply this investigation. If God has isness, how can it possibly create that isness? Where did isness come from? And if isness comes from something that has no isness or is before isness, then how in the world can I know it? Because everything that I know or used to know or I'm used to knowing has isness, is experiential. The one absolute being beyond experiencing how can I know the one absolute? Only by going to the God state, I, I, free of a body and a world and location, and in that pristine bliss of all pervasive beingness, realize that even that is false. Even that's an illusion, ultimately. That it came out of something that is not and if something that is comes from something that is not and is based on something that is not, then that which is also is not. Because there can be only one reality. The one did not create a separate reality called God. It created a distortion appearing as God, appearing as the light of awareness. But the one original state, in its original state, its stateless state, before any state came about,
is the only reality, and id is beyond isness. It's beyond being. The illusion, the first and foremost and final illusion, the Alpha and the Omega of all of creation is God, the God ego, the God identity, the I am that I am, the pure universal isness. <laughs> that God, that beingness is the substratum of all other illusions, of all other distortions made out of that isness. That is God. So it's great. It is your God from this point of view. But it's God that got you into this trouble, and it's God that'll take you out. <laughs> Go to the door. You'll find it is open. Go to the door of I am, that I am, that I am, free of body, free of thought, free of mind. Not I am the body being I am. No, I am before I was the body trying to be I am. Before you thought of being, before you thought of spiritual practice, before you heard my voice, that wordless state of beingness is the isness, is the awareness, it's the universal I which knows itself. That I, I is God. That God came into being at a certain moment. It is an expression inside of the one infinite reality which has no isness, because that would be a limitation. It could no longer be absolute if it had to be. But it gives rise to the illusion of being for the purpose of knowing itself, ultimately. Because in its native state, it cannot know itself. There's no contrast. There's only infinite non-being. Beyond being. Without being, how can it know that it is? It needs being. It needs God. Yes. I'm enjoying this a lot. Mm. Could you um, maybe translate or talk about emptiness? Emptiness. Mm. Tricky concept because there's many different types of emptiness. The most, the one that I've heard about the most frequently in spiritual traditions, such as Buddhism, is the emptiness of awareness, meaning there is the empty space which is self-luminous or self-aware. Awareness is emptiness beingness slash awareness knowingness or lucidity. And so that is as I would describe God. It is God in its formless state. It is God in its state where it knows not where it knows itself, not through forms but through simply itself, through being itself. At that state, there will be a sense, a great sense of emptiness, which also perverates objects. Suddenly objects will seem empty too, because one is rested in the state of emptiness awareness. Does that make sense? Do you have any other question? There's many types of emptinesses you could generate with the mind, but the fundamental original emptiness is the emptiness of God. It's basically, in a sense, it's recognizing that even God doesn't have any substance. It's pretty close in its ability to recognize the Absolute. When you're talking, it reminds me of Jesus saying, Bef before Abraham was, I am. And uh, that uh, triggers the question about emptiness cool. as being the primordial source. Beautiful. Thank you. I guess you could use the word emptiness in some ways for the absolute, but I would not be naturally inspired to use that word to describe the absolute. I would be inspired to describe awareness, the substancelessness of objects, of appearances, as being made out of emptiness awareness. Because the one absolute has no qualities, whereas awareness or God does. God can be described as bliss, as emptiness, as freedom, as joy, as love, as awareness, as lucidity, um, as beingness, as I am. But the absolute is none of these things. Where God in his state 
in its fundamental state of knowing I am that I am, or I, I, that I, I. At that state, it is formless, it doesn't perceive a world, it's collapsed onto itself in its original state of beingness. It doesn't perceive the mental projections on top of it. So quickly. Okay, this is a God, or Brahman, as the Indians call it. This is the Absolute, or Parabrahman, beyond God. Um, God is, can be, I mean, infinite, degree, infinite um, gradations, or infinite levels, you could say. But you could roughly divide it into God with qualities, um, and God without qualities. Or God with form, and God without form. Or God with the perception of a world and God, even when not identified with it anymore, which is the case in self-realized beings, where the formlessness is known so well that even by looking at the world, one still sees emptiness. One still seems the essence of God, the all-pervasiveness of it. But here it seems to be separate and form-based. Uh, so there is awareness with form, there's awareness without form, you could say, knowing itself. But that still has one quality, which is Awareness of being this bliss. Or isness, it still has the quality of being. Even emptiness is. So it has isness. Not, something that is cannot be the absolute. Because it was created by the absolute. It came out of the absolute. And therefore even emptiness is empty. Of being empty. Because it's based on what's beyond emptiness. Even subtler than emptiness. The absolute has no qualities. You can know it, therefore, not by meditating on it so much, although there is some ways you could do that. But it knows itself most pronouncedly in contrast to God. So get to know God, get to know the fullness, realize that everything exists inside and as the universal I am, the beingness that appears as all things. Once that is clear in your awareness and you're rested, and this is all without a lot, if any, mind. This is by being it. Right? So you're being it, especially at this level. Then you can start to ask yourself these intuitive investigations, inquiry, inquiries, 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 that, um, that allow you to realize the absolute in contrast to the all-encompassing isness. If even the all-encompassing isness is not the absolute, then what in the world is? Stay in the question mark. And the question mark will get you out of creation and make you realize the absolute, hopefully. So in contrast to pure beingness, you can realize the absolute. That's why it's important to get familiar with the universal I, I as well. Thank you. Some announcements. Um, regular weekly meetings in Sedona will take place over the summer. 
um, ask the audience to join the Bentinho Massaro Sedona Adept Group on Facebook to be notified about the local meetings and events in Sedona. So if you go to Facebook and in the search bar type in Bentinho Massaro Sedona Adepts, you will find that group. Request to join. Someone will approve, um, I think. <laughs> and then, so you're all in the loop on these events, and you can let each other know too if some of you guys are not on Facebook or whatever. I trust that it'll just circle around. We'll try to keep it as consistent as we can going forward, but this was a one off meeting at this venue. We'll probably have another venue next week. We're not sure yet. Um, so stay tuned in that group. And um, over time, it might be worth it to uh, start a local newsletter group as well. And one more thing. Uh, the recording of this meeting can be found at bentinomasaro.tv. And there's an upcoming retreat in July in the Netherlands, July 10th through 16th. Thanks, Ella. Thank you all. This was lovely, for me at least. So there's no next meeting scheduled just yet. So just stay tuned to that group or, you know, ask around a little bit and you'll figure it out. <laughs>